Please consider supporting Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. You can learn more about them at bwunited.ca. Uh, they are always looking for donations and volunteers. So please, again, support Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. Again, that website is bwunited.ca. This is Dmitry Samarov from Chicago, Illinois. And I love listening to Vish Khanna's Creative Control because whether he's talking to a favorite musician or actor of mine or someone I've never heard of, it's as if he's introducing me to a new friend. And the way things are going, couldn't you use a new friend? Listen now. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Leanne Batasimasak Simpson is a Mississauga Nishnabek writer, scholar, and musician, and a member of Alderville First Nation, who is based in Peterborough, Ontario. The author of seven books, including 2021's A Short History of the Blockade, which captures a lecture she gave in 2020, and it's out now via University of Alberta Press, and also 2020's breathtaking novel, Nopaming, The Cure for White Ladies, which is available via House of Anansi and the University of Minnesota Press, Simpson is now set to release a stunning new album as well. It's called Theory of Ice and comes to us courtesy of You've Changed Records on March 12th, 2021. Leanne and I caught up recently for a discussion about the eerie feeling of releasing physical works in a virtual world. Her new books and the socio-cultural foresight of indigenous people and their practices the collaborators and inspiring people who helped shape Theory of Ice, the concepts of constructive criticism and generative refusal, quoting Gord Downey's lyrics and how he used his final years alive to publicly platform Canada's injustice towards our Indigenous populations, future plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control and Massey Hall's concert film series live at masseyhall.com where you can stream dozens of 30-minute films for free including performances by past podcast guests like Tanya Tagak plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton This is the 599th episode of Creative Control, featuring the truly brilliant Leanne Batasimasak Simpson with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Leanne. How's it going? Hi, Vish. It's going well. Nice to speak with you again. First of all, where in the world are you? I am in Peterborough, Ontario. Now, that's where you live all the time, is that right? <laughs> that is where I live all the time now, <laughs> yes. <laughs> have, you lived, have you lived elsewhere? Uh, yes, I've lived in a, a lot of other places. I've lived in... I grew up in Wingham, Ontario, and I went to the University of Guelph, and then I lived in Sackville, New Brunswick while I was going to Mount Alliston University. And then I lived in Thunder Bay for a while. And then I lived in Winnipeg doing my PhD at the University of Manitoba. And then I moved to Peterborough. Oh, okay. Now, wait a minute. You went to the University of Guelph. Sorry, that's the one that stuck out for me because, as you mm-hmm. know, I lived in Guelph for many years. Uh, what? Wh- yeah. when, when did you attend the University of Guelph? It would have been in the early 1990s. Oh, okay. So a little bit ahead mm-hmm. of me. I got there in like yeah. 96. So we did mm-hmm. There's we did not cross paths per se, I'm guessing. 
Or, That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You were. When when did you leave Guelph? If I might ask. Ninety five. Did you like Guelph? I did like Guelph. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty it's cool. A great little city. Now Peterborough and Guelph. For those who don't know, listening from around the world potentially, Peterborough and Guelph, sort of related cities in some ways. Kind of similar cities. Uh, often those of us who live in either city feel like yeah, a real kinship between the two cities. Do you see similarities between the two? Yeah, when I first moved here, there was a there was a trashateria. I was here too. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Same club. We had, that's right. Yeah. We used to have a tra- and, I'm, I, and oddly enough, the owner's name was Mike Watt, but it wasn't the famous Mike Watt. It was club owner Mike Watt. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so we both had trashaterias. That's yep. pretty much the bond was sealed then. Basically, the bond right? was sealed. <laughs> <laughs> so how are things going for you in Peterborough? And I asked this. Uh, to, in order to maybe contemplate the year that has been as we're speaking, you know, it's almost coming up on sort of an anniversary of us kind of locking down because of the pandemic. How has the past year been for you? I think in some ways, I mean, you can't, I can't complain. My family's healthy. I have a roof over my head. We have work. So I, I think all of those things are I'm, I'm very, very grateful for because I know that this has this pandemic has uh, really impacted different communities and different individuals in asymmetric ways. So I feel grateful for that. I think it's I've released a lot of stuff during the pandemic and it it's a very strange experience to release books and records it almost feels like you're releasing them into this void. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I feel like I've done so many Zoom book launches, but I have very, very few memories of any of them. Mm. And it, it, I feel like this, this, it doesn't feel like a a really celebratory uh, year anniversary of, of, of being at home now for, for a year. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, uh, oddly enough, your name was invoked by Damien Rogers when Damien and I had a chat. Mm -hmm. And I believe, if I recall correctly, Damien was basically saying that you two had a conversation and it felt like you you barely felt like you you both released books in the past 12 months, but it didn't even feel like you released anything because it just went out and it floated away because there were no festivals or there were no gatherings is that what you're getting at a little bit? Like, it's almost like you're making lots of stuff, but then it just sort of it doesn't vanish, per se. I mean, here you and I are talking about something. Obviously, it resonated with me. Uh, <laughs> but does, does that does, does that feeling, is that notion, does that resonate with you? That it sort of feels like we're making things, they come out, but then they kind of float away. Yeah, they kind of float away. And I think for me, it's because that there's no embodied experience attached to the release there's no my band isn't getting together to play a release show or to do a little tour and i'm missing those i'm missing that face to face uh coming together and and celebrating but also standing together in a room and um this sort of ideas and the energies that come out of that i think i think that part is something that i maybe didn't appreciate as much as I should have before then. Yeah. And then I think it really puts the focus on on making. Like if you're gonna do this work, you better really, really like <laughs> writing and you better really, really like making records with people because that's the part of the process that you have control over and that's the part of the process. That for me really brings most of the joy anyway. You're getting at something that I think some of us have been wrangling with over the past year or so, maybe longer. We're kind of learning a lot more about ourselves because Mm -hmm. of the adversity and because of having to spend so much time, not only if we're lucky with our families, like our immediate families, but with ourselves. It sounds to me like when you talk about you, you really have to love something, that's something you might learn during a period like this. What am I really like? You know, what do I really, what do I really like? And what am I really like? Have you had moments of self-discovery and introspection that have had any profound impact on you or your work in this uh, last year or so? I think that at first, in the first part of the pandemic, the introverted part of me was really embracing 
the the being at home and the wearing jogging pants every day and <laughs> and not having to say any unnecessary sentences. <laughs> <laughs> I like the unnecessary set. You know, well, what are the what is it an example of an unnecessary sentence? It's it's some things are conjuring for me. I but... kind of think sometimes when you're an introvert, all sentences seem very unnecessary. <laughs> and then as the time has 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 marched on. I can start to see the limits of, of that approach on, yes. uh, on one's outlook on life. And so <laughs> <laughs> okay. I feel like living an interesting life and having meaning in one's life, is, it, that, those two things are very important to me. And um, so the challenge of finding that in your, your bedroom for a year is, is interesting. Uh, you, you're an introvert. Are you a misanthrope? Do you like people? I like uh, certain people <laughs> a lot. We like our friends. We like our families. But strangers, right. you know, sometimes I think about all the time. Normally, I'd be on buses to get to work or That's right. or in traffic, you know, and that is really minimized. And I like that. I feel like I'm mm. saving time. One thing I will say, I know it's hard. It's hard for lots of people. But I really, because I'm not struggling with this isolation i really value the time i feel like there's mm -hmm. we got some of us who have commuted or whatever shoved our kids on the buses and then got them later and then every night when i lived in guelph before we left every night taking the kids to swimming lessons skating lessons like all these things all the time which you know i'm sad about not being able to do that on the other hand kind of nice to just be at home yeah, and uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> find other things to think about and things to do. You, we were talking ostensibly about these virtual lives. And I feel like in your work, uh, and it's come up on this record, uh, Theory of Ice, and I believe this is uh, a piece, I'm speaking of viscosity. Uh, this piece comes up, just so everyone is aware, I have read two of your books, Leanne, in the last little while, and a record. You've given me a lot to consume before we <laughs> chat so there's enough fodder Leanne. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's great it, no it's good so the books are just so people uh, know this and i've already framed this uh, earlier for those uh, listening but uh, the books are a short history of the blockade giant beavers diplomacy and regeneration in nishnabewin and then uh the other book is uh nopaming the cure for white ladies these both came out in the last year Yes. Yes. So I want to get back to viscosity because, well, I don't want to frame this yet. Can you, I, I've, I'm homing in on this particular song because I feel like it might have relevance to internet life as well, social media life a little bit. Do you know where I'm coming from? What would you say that song is kind of alluding to per se? Well, I think this song was written before uh, the pandemic and it was, it is sort of considering um, some of the meanness that interactions on social media and uh, and the internet can embody because of that sort of disconnectedness. Yeah. And hearkening then towards just those simple, simple pleasures of, of having a fire on a beach with friends and, and finding comfort and, and hope and maybe solace and peace in in those face-to-face -face relationships so it was for me just sort of a very pragmatic approach to life I, I think that that's that uh, the land and, and spending time outside with um <laughs> the, the two people I like um <laughs> is something that has makes my heart feel filled and now in the pandemic it's something that i think uh has taken on a new a new value um it's become more intensified yeah so one of the the the, the lyrics uh the words that have stuck out to me uh in this particular song that seem to relate to computer life tethered to the kinship of disassociated zeros and ones that's coding that's my son is all into computer coding right now. And so yeah. I'm, I'm very up on what zeros and ones means, I think. Uh, <laughs> shining uh, your crown of neoliberal likes, yelling the loudest in the empty room, gathering followers like berries. 
uh, feeding fish to insecurity. That to me, very much about our relationship with social media and how, I mean, you've, you, you've invoked phrases like followers, likes, these are all yep. kind of social media terminology. What is it? Cause you're kind of not on social media now. Is that right? That is correct. So you find it problematic. I find it problematic for my for myself and I also know that it's also very useful in terms of promoting work and I also I think I'm from a generation that grew up without the internet so I have this experience that my children actually don't have now of life before social media and life before the internet and I think that the internet and social media can't be without critical thought. Mm -hmm. So as much as uh, it's very valuable for lots of different people, I think it's also important to to think about the harm that it can cause and the damage that it can cause as well. Right. And to think carefully about how we're using it to connect or to disconnect. Yeah, yeah. just generally. Now you, but at the same time, you've how long have you been sort of off social media? Were you ever on it? I was on it. I was on it. Um, it was very, very useful in the organizing around I Don't Know More. Mm -hmm. um, I've been off it for th four or five years now, I think, three or four. So no, yeah, nothing, no platforms, nothing. That's no. okay. No, that's fine. What I was getting at, though, is because I read your work and you clearly, uh, I think because of your children, you seem very up on it up on the lingo, up on sort of the conventions and what people tend to do. Is that fair? You're monitoring social media a little bit through what your kids yes. are up to. Is that right? I'm monitoring it also independent of, of them because I think they're using it differently than maybe my demographic is using it. Hmm. But I do I do monitor it because I think it's, it's a very important part of life. Right. And I feel like I... If you're making interventions, and if you're saying something meaningful, I think you have to sort of know what's going on in the world. Right. So we often have we often discover, I think, from a place of initially from a place of ignorance, and then maybe it's revealed to us that there are many contemporary uh, sort of behavioral corollaries uh, to what we're doing or what we should be doing in relation to indigenous stories and, and, the, and the activities of indigenous peoples. Is there any corollary between the way social media is utilized uh, and uh, the ways of indigenous people of the past? I just wonder, this is maybe confusing, but I feel like maybe there's some oral, for, to maybe delve into a cliche, maybe oral storytelling is going on a little bit with social media, but all the judgment and all the insecurity and all the psychic pain <laughs> engaging with social media every day has inflicted upon some of us. Do you, is there some corollary there with stories from your peoples or, or, or others? I really, I really love the oral, the oral tradition within the Anishinaabek context. I think it's a really, really beautiful way of um, sharing and, and transmitting knowledge and experience and and connection and i think it's a network like the internet is a network i think there's that similarity mm. but i think knowledge gets shared and generated through a series of of deep and complex relationships and so if you have if you're practicing a healthy kind of intimacy and a healthy kind of connection and belonging and the ethics that go along with that, then I think the kinds of knowledge that you're generating, the kinds of relationships you're having with not just other humans, but all of all of the living things that make up our our world, then you're you're engaging in a in a in a in a world building practice. Hmm. And so I think that that's one of the reasons I think I really love performing is because you're you know when you're writing a book. You're not, I'm not there sitting with you, watching you read Nopaming. But when I'm performing with my band and there's an audience there, which seems so strange to me to say now because the last few times I've performed, there was no <laughs> audience or the audience was, I wasn't interacting with them. I wasn't seeing 
the look on people's faces or I didn't, you don't know if you have their attention, the connection, you're not connecting mm. in the same way. Right. It's also a, like a tremendous amount of responsibility because you're creating sort of a little bubble in time and space to connect with people in a certain way. And so I think there's the work of the oral tradition, the work of performance is much, much different than what's happening when I tweet or when I, I share an indigenous story through a video or a, or a radio or even a book um, because that exchange, that real time exchange um, between bodies and minds and spirits and that connection as part of this living network isn't there. Right. It's, a, so, it's an ethereal connection on some level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So this maybe brings us to, well, a few, as I say, there's much work to discuss today, but I thought maybe we could begin. There's a relationship between Nopaming, The Cure for White Ladies, and the, al- the, the book, and the album Theory of Ice. Is that correct? Yes. Right. So I want to begin with Nopaming because chronologically we received that first. Uh, and then I want to ask you to explain <laughs> uh, the book. I've I talked to a few people before I started reading the book and both of them said, you kind of want to read it all at once. And I said, mm-hmm. oh, interesting. That's an interesting perception. Why? And then, of course, I could not heed their advice uh, because of time and mm-hmm. pressures to get other things done. So I didn't do that. I read it in sort of a more fractured way. But I, in retrospect, I think I knew know what they meant. Um, it is a bit of a dense read, I would say, on some level. It's hard to figure out a sense of place sometimes as I'm reading, the, uh, as people read this book, I think. Sorry, does that resonate with you? Does, does it, do I sound like an idiot for saying that? <laughs> um, there are definitely different reader experiences, and that is definitely one that I've heard. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Sure. So I thought we would begin with, uh, with this book. Um, and what I'd like you to do, if possible, is more or less for those who haven't read it, and I also will tell you, I'm, I've become an expert in not giving things away about books and stories. I, I am not a spoiler person uh, in this context, but I hope you can summarize what this book is ostensibly about. Is it possible for you to do that? I'd love to hear your spoiler of what this book Well, this, this one is <laughs> actually, this one's a trickier one to spoil, I suppose. I think we can acknowledge that. That's fair. But uh, yeah, just in your own words, is it possible to sort of um, summarize both the uh, action of the book per se and and within that maybe where the notion for this story came from? I think this book builds on uh, two previous books of mine, um, Islands of Decolonial Love and This Accident of Being Lost, which are books of short stories. Um, There are several reoccurring characters that appear in Nopaming um, because I, I... I fell in love with them and it's I I set out to write something in longer form it's uh, the House of Anansi Press has been calling it a novel but it's certainly a very different kind of of novel Mm. one of the the struggles I had was that within Anishinaabe storytelling we don't have the novel the novel is a very Western literary form with um, certain conventions and certain structures that that we don't have and so um, I didn't let that confine me. Um, so I think the book is very much based on, on ethics and practices of Anishinaabe storytelling. Mm. The main character, or not the main character, the narrator is um, Mashkawaje, which is a word that means he or she or they are frozen in the ice. The character has experienced uh, a trauma. The trauma is not in the foreground of the book. But it has left Mashkawaje shut down and um, disconnected from from their body and from their emotions and from their experience. And I've used the a metaphor of being frozen in a lake hmm. as what that that feels like. So Mashkawaje is relying on these seven other characters for for information and for knowledge and for support and for nurturing as they spend this time in the lake, sort of healing. And these seven characters, um, some of them are older Anishinaabe characters, some of them are sort of, some of them are trees, some of them are caribou. They're very much characters that make sense from within an Anishinaabe uh, world. 
the book takes place in the present. Um, I was very much interested in in thinking about the Anishinaabe worlds that exist uh, in the present, in downtown Toronto, in Peterborough, and all of the interstitial spaces in between, mm-hmm. and the world building of, of these characters. So that was that was one intervention I was I was making uh, was a presencing. I wanted the book to. Um, I think I talk in my academic work a lot about gender, mm-hmm. and one of the things in Anishinaabe language is we don't have gendered pronouns so all of the main characters have they them pronouns so the book is playing with gender in an interesting way i think it's also written almost in a circle so you could start really any place in the book and move through the story in a way that that would take you on a journey it's very coded and layered so there's a lot of um, information that's that's not on the surface. Hmm. There's a lot of space in the book because I think the book is, it was a different way of writing a book and it is therefore a different way of reading a book. So I think readers that are very, very used to and attached to a maybe Western way of storytelling are challenged at the beginning because the plot is not unfolding in the way that the plot usually unfolds. The characters aren't interacting in a way that they that they usually interact. And so some some readers, particularly Anishinaabe readers, have found the book very, very easy to understand and easy to, to get into. Right. And then I think there's other readers that have had to struggle to, to get through it and to find meaning. Um, and I think both of those experiences are, are, are good and are fine and are generative. And then I think the other part of it was I thought a lot about setting and plot and I really wanted this that kind of relationality that I was talking about at the beginning of our discussion this deep relationships between human characters between the spirit world and the humans the humans and the plants and the animals I wanted that to almost form the setting for the book yeah I wanted that to build the world so I think the book is doing a very different it's doing very different work in the world than than a lot of books and um, I'm really actually some parts of me are really amazed that it got published at all (laughs) and I'm certainly um, it's been really great to see how it's it's traveled in the world at the beginning of the pandemic I knew this book was coming out in September and my sister Ansley and I did a really short EP called the Nopaming Sessions of Mm -hmm. four readings from the book just to sort of help that the book travel and then um, we did a video for the first part of the book called solidification with um, a new media artist who's Taiwanese from um, East Vancouver Sammy Chien and so that sort of provided there's a lot of travel in the book and there's a lot of layering Hmm. and I think that you have to engage in the book in a deeper way in order to have uh, that meaning revealed so so to your to maybe your point and others it is something you have to dig into and maybe read all at once and maybe several times uh, even to really uh, navigate these worlds because that was what I began to recognize. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not... You say it's set in the present, but then there's also this interweaving of, uh, I don't know, spirit world and I guess our world. And there's not a lot... Initially, anyway, I was like, what... Now I'm a goose. What's ha- what's happening? Now I'm I have the goose's perspective. I, you know what I mean. So it's interesting. You don't really, I don't think, unless I missed it. And I will read. You know what? I'm going to read this book again, just based on this conversation. I have to read the whole thing again. <laughs> but I feel like you don't necessarily delineate what world we're in or what perspective we're getting. Uh, and you know, you, there's no glossary of names, so to speak, except. My wife was like, well, you might want to just look at the back of the book every once in a while because at the back of the book explains who the characters are. But there is this sort of my point here is this a little bit of confusion informs the experience. And you're saying that uh, for Anishinaabe people, this confusion wasn't as present, but for others, it might be. That's fair. Yes. I think for indigenous audiences in general, not just Anishinaabe, I feel like this is this is how the structure of this book wasn't difficult and understanding the book wasn't difficult and they didn't experience confusion. I think that what I didn't do, what I could have done, but I chose not to, 
is I could have made the book more accessible to non-Indigenous audiences Hmm. by structurally, by explaining more, by providing a glossary. But I wanted, I didn't, I chose not to do that. I chose not to do that for a few reasons because I think the process of of reading and looking those words up on online dictionaries and of having discussions of seeking out podcasts of you know googling what the the cover image is and of listening to the the music and of watching the videos I feel like that process of of learning of knowing and unknowing is a valuable process for readers and because I I think that it's very rare that somebody or that we're able to write for or to our own people. Yeah. And I think that's, that was really valuable too. So I think this is a world that, that makes sense to Anishinaabe people and it's operating in the present and we're living in this world and this is a window into it for, for non-Indigenous readers. Right. So you've ostensibly created, for non-Indigenous readers anyway, it is something of a interactive experience, or it could be. Uh, it's it almost could be. It could, It's almost like a choose-your-own-adventure book in that <laughs> you're not flipping through sections of the book, but if you're stumbling, it might be time to go do some research. Uh, sure. and, and you're leaving that to us to do instead of holding our hands. And yes. And there's an artfulness to that, too, if I might say. I didn't, by the way, if, if it's not clear, I did not resent not knowing what was happening. I did not resent any aspects of it. I was just, like, compelled by it. But I was also like, this is interesting. I'm left on my... I felt alone. You made me feel <laughs> very alone as I was reading your book. But I also appreciated that uh, on some level, for sure. So the relationship... You said another thing there that I just wanted to follow up on uh, about uh, they-them pronouns. And that's fascinating to me that you 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 mentioned was it was specifically the Anishinaabe that do not uh, that that in, that only use they them pronouns. Is that what you said? It's in the language. Um, we have a lot of verbs. We have mostly verbs, and so an example would be bimuse means he, she is walking. So there isn't gendered pronouns, and we also have more than two genders. Okay. So there's a spectrum of, of genders, and that's encoded in, in the language. And that's other indigenous cultures and languages do that as well. So this is, this is something that while we, I would say, in Western society and contemporary society have had a real reckoning with this and are still adapting to this notion of perhaps it's best not to gender people in, in our pronoun use, you say you this your indigenous people have been doing this for much longer uh, how like forever almost is that fair forever and then things like residential schools and the indian act and the assimilation assimilation sort of policies of of the canadian government were very much involved in the very very early stages of colonialism in erasing and disappearing uh, two-spirit and queer Mm. identities and imposing this colonial gender binary. And it's something that's replicated in our communities now because of that, uh, that violence. Right. Where I was coming from is non-Indigenous people seem to always be catching up. Do you ever look at us and think, oh, here we go. Finally, (laughs) they're catching up. Like, is that, is that a perception you have? Because it seems to me, I think of uh, anytime I think of conversations I've had with Buffy St. Marie, for example, I realize that Buffy has been ahead of us in music, in technology, Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. in ways of foreseeing ecological collapse. And, you know, when you read that Buffy has been talking about this since the 60s and we still haven't done anything about it. How frustrating is that? What is wrong with us, the non-Indigenous people? Why don't we pay attention? I mean, I think I know the answers to this, obviously, and they're horrific answers. But does it frustrate you to, to see us not or to take so long to recognize things that indigenous people have been pointing out forever? I think you, you all should have a summit about that and see if you can <laughs> figure it out. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. I feel like I it's something that's, that's just it's always been it's all I've known. It's always been the case. And I think for me, I've made a decision to really focus internally and focus with inside Anishinaabewan 
to think through these things rather than try to be always responding to to the non-indigenous yeah sure i wish we listened and i wish we paid more attention and uh uh, I'm not separating myself from that. I just wish I was more in tune with these ideas because it feels like they're, we would all be better off, it feels like to me. And I'm not just saying this to you. I just, this is just generally a feeling I have, if you know what I mean. I think that we would build a different, we would build different worlds. And I think a lot of, of people have been talking about that for a long time. And I think it's intensified, you know, yeah. with, with Black Lives Matters and, and abolition and defend the police and and farmers and in India there's lots of different groups that are are that hold these sort of bodies of knowledge and and I think now is a really interesting time to be to be discussing and building yeah for sure now so there is a relationship as I said earlier there's a relationship between uh, this book uh, Nopaming and your new album theory of ice uh, can you explain that relationship uh, what is the connection between the two I think in the past, because I have an academic background and I've come to writing fiction and making music later in life, um, in my first two books, there was also a record sort of attached to them for Islands of Decolonial Love and this accident of being lost with mm -hmm. flight. Yep. And so in this iteration, I wanted to have the project stand on their own. And I wasn't actually, I didn't intend for them to be be related, but I was sort of working on them at the same time. And I'm very interested in how meaning gets transformed. So in the middle of Nopaming, there is a, a series of poems that Mash Kawaja writes. And th that series of poems I took and adapted them into lyrics and made some of them into songs that becomes the theory of ice. And so there was a little bit of a transformation and I think there's a transformation in, in meaning when you you read a poem versus hearing the song and then I think there's going to be a few videos as well so seeing seeing those ideas visually represented and those sounds visually represented mm. I like how that travels and how how things shift and so Theory of Ice I think very much stands on its own and Nopaming stands on its own but I think again for those for those readers or those listeners that go digging, you'll find another set of relationships in a in a deeper deeper sense of meaning. So we were talking a little bit about uh, how particularly non-indigenous people might relate to your book, and I wonder if and we talked. I, I invoked the idea that you weren't holding our hands in the book in terms of its structure uh, and what we're used to. The album feels a little more uh, accessible uh, or quite a bit more accessible but at the same time it has an ethereal feeling uh, as well that has a lot to do with the atmosphere and the tone I think also your delivery as a vocalist has long captivated me because is it fair to say you, you, you tend to employ a more of a spoken word style singing voice is that fair? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So there's there's a kind of stillness but uh, also a sense that something a lot is happening if you will and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the tone of the album in terms of just the way it sounds how do you arrive at the sound of theory of ice uh, who helps you get there and and what do you make of it now that it's sort of you've processed it it's it's coming out people will be listening to it uh, can you talk a little bit about that just the, the feeling of the album I think that this album was a really it was a really long, long journey. It was a, a tremendous amount of work with a, a large team of people. It was not an easy thing to make. I think it is more accessible than the, than the book. I think that working with my voice, first sort of speaking lyrics, and then I sing also on this, this record, it's a, a sort of a different aesthetic and it's a different way of of making a record and so i relied i think on my sister ansley did some of the writing nick ferrio did some of the writing jonas bonetta did some of the writing i was really supported i think vocally in terms of finding uh my voice by steve lamke i think it was a really important 
person in this record because there isn't uh we, we talked a lot about having different or singing voices or speaking voices that are not sort of within the narrow bounds of of commercial music i had a lot of great discussions actually in yellow knife with simone schmidt around that mm-hmm. as well particularly mm-hmm. for women vocalists um jim bryson also was a really big support in terms of finding my voice and i think the sound I think we almost found the sound. We eventually found the sound. A lot of sounds got rejected, <laughs> for sure. But I think we eventually, or I eventually found the sound. I wasn't able to articulate, which was probably one of the issues in the record. I wasn't able to articulate what I wanted until I until I heard it. Yeah. And once I heard it, I I knew for sure. But that's one of the things that I like about making music. It's... I think all of the the writing in our voices, the instruments, our voices, the lyrics, our voices, and the the no, there's just sort of an unlimited number of things that you can do yeah. to communicate with an audience, and that's I find that very very challenging. But I also that's what I love about it. Well, it sounds like you have you had an amazing team to work with. Uh, among the people featured on the record uh, that hasn't been mentioned yet is someone else who I think has a bit of a spoken singing style, John K. Sampson uh, mm-hmm. of The Weaker Thens. Now, you two uh, perform a song together uh, called it's Surface Tension, right? I don't have it in front of me. I apologize. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, Surface Tension. Beautiful song. I wonder about that collaboration and that connection because, as I say, uh, my, uh, again, this morning my wife was like, this is John K. Sampson? And I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is in the background. You both are kind of softly attacking the words of this song and it, it meshes beautifully uh, how did that connection come about and what kinds of discussions did you have about how you would in fact attack that song so to speak john and i've been friends uh, for a really long time now and he was uh, the first person that published me as a writer when he was with arp books in winnipeg and so I had a relationship with him first as a as an editor and he was very very important in terms of me developing as a writer finding my voice yeah I don't think that I would be where I am today without him and his support and holding space for me Mm. and then I think as an artist with his solo work and also with the weaker thans he's an incredible writer an incredible lyricist his voice is also outside of the the realm of what's commercially you normally hear in pop Mm -hmm. music Mm -hmm. i like the way that he moves in the world and and the way he embodies ethics and politics and so i think this song um, i've always wanted to collaborate with with him musically but we're both lyricists so that's (laughs) that's more (laughs) difficult and then this was this I'm trying to think of when we recorded this. It would have been, I think, just either prior to the pandemic. And so I rec- we didn't have any discussion, actually, on, on what what this would sound like. Uh, we sent him me singing, and he he sang with me and matched. Oh, I, I see. The okay. delivery. Yeah. And did, yeah he, and did he contribute lyrics at all? He did not contribute lyrics. Okay. Although I feel like that song, when I wrote that song lyrically and when we were developing it musically it was very much a a nod to the way that John writes songs yeah and so it um it made sense to me and that I feel like that's it was so it's it's very very meaningful to me that we were able to do that with him yeah yeah. it's it's a wonderful wonderful song it's funny you, you talked about certain conversations you had with people like Steve Lampke and Simone Schmidt and you, you've invoked, uh, when talking about John, you talked about that, you know, his style is not maybe conventional or mainstream. It seems to me that you're very cognizant of what not to do as much as what you want to do. Like you, you kind of are working uh, in, in coming up with ideas that maybe haven't been done before. Like that's just a conscious thought. I think a lot of us strive to do that. Is that a fair assessment? And if so, do you know where that kind of comes from? This notion of like, okay, everyone has already done this sort of thing and I don't want to do something that's been done before. I also don't want to do something that is pandering, I suppose. Uh, 
Do you know where that sort of, how that has been instilled within you to sort of be conscious of that? I think it's very much Leanne. It's just being Leanne. Like I said, I have to write a novel and this is what freaking came out. <laughs> you are. It's I'm not, actually trying to be conventional. <laughs> but is that is that contrarianism or is it just, no, it's just uh, exploratory? I think it's, um, I think that I'm trying to be Anishinaabe in, in this, this kind of colonial world. And I think in my community, particularly for my ancestors, everybody had their own story and everybody had their own voice and everybody sang all the time, whether or not they were good at singing or not. They sang because it, it's a really ephemeral, I think, um, expression of, of who one is and what, what your contribution is to the web of life. And I, I really, really like that idea and sort of in contemporary times and under capitalism everybody doesn't have their own song and everybody doesn't get to tell their own story we have these specific people art becomes very individualized and yeah. and certain people get celebrated for it and only the the best voices get heard and so i really like this idea of finding your voice and telling your story and doing it in a way that's meaningful and that makes sense to you and that is that is a, an honest expression of who you are. I like how that then gives the the work a way of traveling in the world and connecting to other other people, which I think for me is is the point. Yeah, of all of this. Where I'm, I'm, I guess I'm coming from a perspective where I feel like your work is. You talk about world building, and I appreciate that. And I, but I also get the sense that there's an oppositional framework to some of your work like when I think I mentioned some of the comments you made about how you wanted to present yourself on this record as a and in maybe as opposed to the way other people do in particularly in the colonial world Nopaming is, the title is a response to English Canadian settler and author Susanna Moody's 1852 memoir Roughing It in the Bush a response it seems to me you are speaking to the colonial world in on some level in all in a lot of your work is that fair i think in some ways it's it's what i've called a in and other people have called a generative refusal like i'm refusing the colonial world and i'm inviting you in and building something different yeah and so it's not just a critique and it's not just a this sucks it's also creating spaces for for joy and connection yes yes and, and it, that seems your other book that i invoked earlier uh a short history of the blockade it is a book but it is uh it, it is the end result of a lecture you gave right yes right and i've i who did the uh, uh one of the who introduced you that night or that evening jordan abel right he makes a point of saying that you you invoke the notion of it's not it's time rather than simply critiquing the past, we have to start thinking about building things. Is that right? Is that I'm paraphrasing, but is is that accurate on some level? That's accurate on some level and I think also indigenous people have always been building things. That's the way that we have approached life. Um so if I think of of my ancestors, you know, 400 years ago, they were makers. They got up every morning and they had to make everything. They didn't rely on institutions or bank accounts. Yeah. They had to make their system of governance and politics. They had to make breakfast. They had to make their clothes. They had to make their transportation system. And so they were very much aligned in, in, creative, in a creative space. And I think that, I think, is really important for us to continue and to I think that's how you generate knowledge, actually, is by making things and doing things. Yeah, just to maybe fine tune what I was sputtering about there. I, I actually can I read what mm -hmm. what Jordan wrote here or said that day, that night in Dancing on Our Turtles Back. Simpson writes that, quote, critique and revelation cannot in and of themselves create the kinds of magnificent change our people are looking for, end quote, and that instead of spending all our time critiquing, we should be, quote, spending an enormous amount of energy recovering and rebuilding. Simpson's thinking here blew my mind. The idea that one needs to be very, very careful with making judgments and with the act of criticism, end quote, challenged me to think outside of the usual structures and try to do something generative. That's, I feel like that, that kind of captures you in some, in a very profound way. Do you agree? 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay, we solved it. That's good. I'm glad we got to the bottom Just of that. Stuck that off your list. <laughs> I want to ask you a, a, a few more things about uh, this record. First of all, the song "The Wake" um, stuck mm-hmm. out to me, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what inspired that song and maybe the subject of that song. I think that song is is about grief and about loss. I had lost. Uh, someone in my life that was really really important and the song was a um, I think written at that that point in my life of trying to move through grief and so that was actually I think that was the most difficult song on the record to record we have like (laughs) we have four or five different recorded demos of it we've Hmm. had it as a like kind of a fast punk version we've got like campfire versions but it was really difficult to to figure out what that song was going to sound like and I think ultimately it was Jim Bryson that ended up it started sort of as a very acoustic sort of folk song and then it didn't musically seemed like it was enough so we tried a bunch of of other of other things we tried different tempos we Hmm. we added lots more instrumentation and then at the end he he sort of i'm i don't know if he he something spoke to him and he just in the studio when we were trying to record it he just picked up an acoustic guitar and played sort of that version of it and that resonated perfectly with me and it sort of went full circle back to that kind of more stripped back mm. folkish song I, I, want, I guess I imagine the emotional content of the song makes it difficult to settle on a version that seems to do the emotion justice is that fair that's fair and I also think the other thing that was going on is I think when you're in grief and when you're it, it's very difficult to make artistic decisions when you're very much still processing the emotion that that generated the song in the first place. So I think once I got through a little bit of the more intense sort of grief, I was able to have a more balanced and less sort of emotional reactionary sort of conversations about what it was going to sound like. I think I had to process the grief to get to the point where I could figure out what the sound of the song was going to be. And I think the song helped me me do that. I think that process of going and I think Steve Lamke was also a really important person. We we drove to Toronto one day and rented a studio and I just, he I was like, just act like a producer right now. And I think he, he just held space and for the whole day I just sang that song hmm into the mic over and over and over and over and over again. And that was, I think, got me through. I don't even know if he would, I don't know what he would say about it actually, but I feel like that got me through whatever was blocking that, that part of it and, and um, released or processed some of the, the, the grief and the emotion behind it so that I could start to hear, hear the song with, with new ears. Well, I, first of all, I want to say that I'm very so sad to uh, hear of your loss uh, for what that's worth. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Secondly, uh, Steve is uh, an all-time champion. I will say that. Uh, I don't know what that means exactly. I don't know what the contest is, but Steve is one of my <laughs> Steve is one of my oldest friends, dearest friends, and so it's uh, I love that we're both on these paths. Uh, where we our work uh, intersects, you know, a conversation with you uh, about a record that he helped bring into the world, and you know, his label you've changed is putting out. It's great. I just want to say that I feel very connected to him, and I I know where you're coming from. He's a he's a mentor uh, to me, and I think a, a mentor to to so many, and very quietly and unassumingly so. So. It's nice He's to hear. He's an exceptional human, and I feel like <laughs> this. I've got to know him through making this record and through releasing this record we've well i think that we've become friends i don't know what he would say i'm sure i'm sure he would say that yeah yeah but i feel like he just really consistent gentle energy and support really got this record 
to the, to the place that it is today. Yeah. So I'm very, very grateful to him. It's, uh, as I say, I'm grateful to him too. Uh, and I think uh, you, you're, you're touching upon some character traits of his that are uh, evident to those of us who know him well. So nice to hear that. This song, The Wake, uh, caught my attention also because it invokes a lyric by Gord Downey from one of his solo albums. Uh, the song is called The East Wind. And the line is, hello again, my friend. I've come to see you again. Why why invoke that in this song? I, I appreciate the context now that you've explained uh, what inspired the song and that you were grieving. But at the same time, that's a very specific phrase I associate with him. That album means a lot to me, too, because that's, I think, the only time I interviewed Gord uh, mm-hmm. officially. Like, we met many times mm-hmm. and talked many times, but... The only time I interviewed him, I was really digging deep into that album, uh, The Grand Bounce. So it caught my attention. What? Why? Why, Leanne? <laughs> Why use these uh, these lines? Because he was, at the time that I was writing this album, he was, he was dying and then he died. Yeah. And this song, The East Wind, in my grief, became this song that I played over and over and over again, day in and day out. And I found I was, I I was attached to the song, uh, for reasons I can't explain. Mm. And so, that opening line became um, just a jumping off point, I think, for this song. Okay. Yeah. So it was his being and the circumstance that inspired you to grab it, I suppose, uh, and, and the song itself. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful song, and it's. It's uh, it's it's so well written, and I, I yeah, it's fascinating. It. It's it's eleven years old now. I think that song. It came out so long ago. Uh, That's right. So I like, it, but that album really sticks in my head too. Like it, it yeah. just, it, it's one of the best ones. It's it's the so. least. It's one of the least sort of um, rickety on some level. Like it feels, the like it was pretty more it was more of the solo records he'd put out it was quite produced interestingly like it yeah anyway sorry i don't want to talk too much about him but i appreciate he was a someone i would call a a, an associate a something of a friend he always responded to me uh which Mm -hmm. he didn't need to do and our encounters were always fun so he haunts me still uh that he that he's gone and uh i guess i also wonder given i was just saying this to someone the other day i i feel like his last years really did impact the work he was doing and the awareness he was r- raising around indigenous issues. I know some of my friends and colleagues scoffed at this white savior complex this guy seemed to have. What is your opinion on, on the work he did uh, towards the end there? I, I personally, I feel like it. I hear more about the issues he raised now than I did before. And I feel like that's a very, it might be implicit. People may not associate him with that awareness, but... That's my perspective. What is your perspective on the work he was doing towards the end of his life? I think it's a good thing that there's a lot of people who have now heard of a lot of indigenous issues yeah. that that hadn't. And I think that that's a very good thing. I also think there's just a tremendous number of, of indigenous people that have been doing this work for, for so, so, so long. So I think if those folks sort of use what they learned from Gord to to find the the indigenous voices and the indigenous stories and the indigenous organizing that doesn't get this get into the spotlight I think that 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 can be a, a good thing yeah I, I mean I think that's what he was doing I don't I think he was like I have this platform and this profile I'm going to use it for this and I didn't think it was some sort of ego thing you know what I mean and I mm-hmm. I, I, I found it very problematic that people went that route with him because I, in my personal experience with him, he had a generosity of spirit that few people I've ever encountered have had uh, for someone mm-hmm. of his stature to give me time and give people like me time and attention. Uh, anyway, that's all I'll say. I, I just miss him. So, I, and I appreciated that you invoked him there. It reminded me of him. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, obviously, I was like, wait, that's Gord. I knew that, I know the, that turn of phrase. And then mm-hmm. the more I read, when I started to read more about, um, well, actually, sorry, then I finished your book and I saw that you cited the line specifically because on the on the one hand hello again my friend i've come to see you again anyone could say that you know what i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i was like that's uh, anyway that's that's fine speaking of uh great singers uh and uh important figures willie dunn uh mm. you have uh 
you have created a version of one of his, uh, if not his most iconic song, I Pity the Country. Can you tell uh, me a little bit more about that decision? Uh, maybe what that song means to you, first of all? My band was invited to play at a concert at the uh, National Arts Center in Ottawa. I was there. For the, I was there right, for that. Yeah, yeah. For the Native North American, yeah. for that for that album. Yeah. And a lot of the old timers were playing and Elanisa Bobswin was singing and Willie Thrasher was there with Linda Saddleback and Willie Mitchell. And that generation of indigenous musician, I think has been really, really important to me as a human. I think that they were making music at a time that it was very difficult for indigenous people to make music. I think that I have a lot of privilege in terms of platforms and instruments and funding and an audience that they that they didn't have, but they they did it anyway. And and they're so beloved in in our our community. So it was an incredible. It was so meaningful for me to be invited to perform a song. And I wanted to because Willie had died, Willie Dunn had died. I wanted to be able to pay homage to him or honor him at that show. And so I pity the country to me felt the lyrics that he had written in, you know, the late 1960s just resonated uh, like no time had passed at all. And I felt like I could say every one of those words with a full heart and a, and a full mind. And there was a lot of people in the audience. Jonas Mineta was in the audience that night and he was like, heard something in that song. It was also very difficult because the Colton Bushy verdict came down yeah. during the show. Yeah. And Rosanna Deerchild made the announcement that there had been an acquittal right before we took the stage. And so as a performer, it was this moment where that I wasn't expecting, that I wasn't prepared for. It felt like the audience had just been hit. We had all just been hit by a truck. And to go out and to try to form a connection with an audience through this, I guess, hurt, shock, um, anger was, I didn't know how to, to do that, but I knew that I had to be very gentle and I had to be to be careful and so this was the first time that we performed that song and in the sound check we had done the song and all those old timers had sat in the front row during my sound check and I was so nervous I've never been so nervous in a sound check in my whole life because I was like oh what if they if they're not on board for what I'm doing here what if I wreck it um and there were tears in their eyes and they were so they were so grateful and so lovely. And Willie Dunn's family was in the audience that night as well. So Jonas heard it and he said, you know, you got to record it. So we did record it really soon after that at his studio, at Port William Sound, a very dry version of it. And then I wanted it to be on the album, but it took a long time to get the album, the, the rest of the songs ready. And then we re-recorded a version for, for the album that's, um, that's not so dry. Yeah. Yeah. And it feels, I think Gavin Gardner really did an excellent job of mastering that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it or sorry, mixing that. It was Heather Kirby that mastered it, but yeah. it really, um, yeah, I was, I, it was one of those songs that it was so important to me that I didn't, I it wasn't, I didn't want it to change artistically, but, uh, it did. And, uh, I really love this, this version that's on Theory of Ice. I feel like, Sadly, you were armed with the perfect song that evening Mm, to come uh out on, uh, you know, with that announcement. We got to watch, uh, uh, was it the whole thing? A little bit of a documentary about um, Willie Dunn that evening, as I recall. Uh, That was, was it the whole thing? I can't remember off the top of my head now. It was a bit of a blur. But do you remember what I, were you, or maybe you, maybe you were backstage, but we watched, yeah, we watched uh, some, if not all of a documentary about Willie Dunn, there's an anthology coming out soon Mm -hmm. um, that I'm excited about. Do you have any kind of overarching impression of of him as a person? Uh, Beyond that song, uh, what is your sense of uh, who he was, uh, the work he did, and and how significant it might be for 
all of music, frankly, at this point. I, I find his work to be rather revelatory myself. Do you do you know it well enough to to comment? I think that he it, his life is he's a really, really important person as a musician, as an artist and also as an activist. Um, and the kinds of organizing work that he was doing in Ontario, but also in Vancouver at the time has been really influential, I think, on on me in terms of my my political thinking and my ethical thinking. And so I think that I'm really excited about this retrospective. There's um, a beautiful sort of newspaper that goes along with it called Willie Dunn notes and mm. there's interviews with his family members there's interviews with him and you get sort of a bigger sense of, of who he was as a as a person and his contribution to to music to the indigenous community and to indigenous resistance I think more broadly in Canada yeah so I think that yeah I think that it's it's really great to see some of these these old ones um being celebrated and rediscovered <laughs> yeah no it i i agree and i appreciate your words on this and i appreciate you paying tribute to him by by performing and recording the song it's uh it's a wonderful version of it and really cuts to the heart of it if i might say like for some yeah. it's very i love his version and it's in my head all the time but yours is uh it stands on its own if i may so thank you for that yeah so uh you're not on so this is the point of the uh interview where i start to wrap up and i ask people if they want to uh you know send people to their social media platforms or anything else you know websites these sorts of things uh do you have something you want to direct people to so they can learn more about you i do have websites leanne simpson music.com and leannesimpson.ca is where my, my books and my writing are. So that's a good spot. Okay. Um, Bandcamp's always a, a good spot as well. Okay. So just so I have this correct, and forgive me or correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. The book, uh, Nopa Ming, The Cure for White Ladies, is out now. And people can learn more about it via the publisher, houseofanancy.com. Just do a little game show dings as if I'm correct. Or eh. Is that, is that right? Did I get that part right? Ding. And <laughs> it's also just released in the U.S. by the University of Minnesota Press. Oh, excellent. That's fantastic. That's great to hear. A Short History of the Blockade. Now, this is a, a lecture that has been uh, turned into a, a, a short book, I suppose. It's part of the... Uh, it's the, it's on University of Alberta Press. It's part of a lecture series, right? That's yes. right? Yeah. yeah. And so people can learn more about it at ualberta.ca. Uh can't read the this print on this book is so small a <laughs> there's anyway He's people the old man yeah i'm an old man now <laughs> yeah go to university of alberta press to learn more about this excellent uh, uh it's it's great by the way i will say are you happy with how this it's, it must be interesting to make a speech and then someone turns it into a book well someone pretty amazing turned it into a book hey that's, that's right Michelle did an amazing yeah. job <laughs> my wife was involved with it there's some cronyism here <laughs> My wife was involved in what? Editing it, I suppose. Is that yeah. The, yeah. So yeah. my wife is terrific. and uh, But it is a great, sure is. wonderful, wonderful book, mm-hmm. uh, reading experience as well. Uh, and then, of course, Theory of Ice, uh, the wonderful new album uh, by Leanne Simpson is out now on You've Changed Records, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Now, Leanne, if we can go out on a book, a uh, book, if we can go out on a song. So see, it's so, you have too many things. I can't keep track of them. If we can go out on a song from Theory of Ice, what song would you choose and why? Um, what song would I choose? I think that we should go out on Surface Tension. Ah, this is the collaboration yeah. with John K. Sampson. Is there any, right. anything more you want to say about it? I, I think you told the story, but is there anything more you want to say about it? No, just, uh, just I hope people enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is Surface Tension by Leanne Batasimus X. Simpson from the excellent new record, Three of Ice. Leanne, uh, this was a, a wonderful uh, pleasure for me. Thank you for the time and best luck with everything in the future. Miigwech, Fish.
What an honor that was. Miigwech to Leanne Metasimusak Simpson for appearing on this, the 599th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available wherever you get your podcasts. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my monthly newsletter, oh, Lord, I'm very behind on the newsletters. Every time I say this at the end, I'm like, God damn it. I haven't done a newsletter in a couple months. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do it. I got nothing to say. I say most of what I have to say on the show. I got to write stuff now, too. No, no, no. I'm, I'm really downselling what is usually a pretty entertaining newsletter. I will do the monthly newsletter. Uh, I promise. I'll do it. I'll do another one. Anyway, what was I saying? If you want to sign up for that monthly newsletter, which is delivered with great regularity, monthly even, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on uh, Facebook. I don't like Facebook, but still, we have a page, and I feel like as people are dropping off Facebook, uh, it's uh, less and less engaged with my the page for the show, but whatever. You can like Creative Control on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter, at Vish Creative, or you can follow me directly on Twitter and at uh, on, on Instagram, I should say, at Vish Kana. I will be soon, hopefully, taking up Leanne's call or it wasn't really a call but her stance i might get off of all these things because i don't think they're great for me when i think about it but still for now follow me on twitter and instagram at vishkana also visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to sustain this podcast six dollars or more grants you access to exclusive content and uh, audio content hopefully video content if i can get my act together and if you're interested in receiving a creative control t-shirt please message me on patreon and i'll get you one while supplies last i have to send one to thunder bay i still haven't done that because i haven't been to the post office but i'm going to do it soon thanks again to live at masseyhall.com where you can watch beautifully captured concerts by great canadian artists and also to pizza trocadero the bookshelf and planet bean coffee in guelph and granddad's donuts in hamilton for their in-kind support for this show thanks too to jim guthrie for letting me use music of his on the show He's a dear old friend, and his music is great. You can learn more about him and that at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you for listening to this episode with Leanne Metastamasek Simpson. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll check out her new album, Theory of Ice, and those books I discussed, we discussed as well. That's all I have to say, really. Thanks for listening to the show. If you can, subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends about the show. Maybe they'll do the same. Maybe they'll be into it the way you are. All of that helps a lot. So thank you very much. I will talk to you soon. Bye for now. Miigwech. <laughs>